Good morning, good afternoon, wherever you are. This is uh, Tech for Senior. I'm uh, I'm Ron Brown. I'll be your host today. And this is uh, the last of season three. We are at episode 156, and this is April 27th. Next week will be season four. Uh, this is a one-hour show. I will be with you. And afterwards, we have uh, a question and answer period, and then we'll be moving on to our um, primary event. I want to thank everyone for coming. If you are here in the audience, we want to thank you today. And today will be a day of thanks to you in the audience, as you will see. Uh, then I want to thank those who are on YouTube. And if you're watching this as a YouTube short, then just click the link and you'll take and you'll go right to the show. We have, of course, uh, two shows this week. We have our Tech for Senior, which is today, and then we have our Tech for Senior live show, which is on Thursday. Uh, we have, uh, for those of you who um, have signed up for our newsletter and get our newsletter, you will have got the link to our premiere event today. Uh, if you haven't signed up for our newsletter, and there's just under 900 people we send our newsletter out to, you should because it allows us to communicate with you and tell you what we do. And today in our thank you to you, we will be telling you a lot about all the things that we do. So if you uh, please sign up, if you haven't, you'll get, uh, it's, our, it's, a, it's a communication tool that we have because we have no idea who you are. So uh, in our premiere event today, we will be uh, talking about three, three items. And of course, um, the first one will be by Dewey Kloos. And I was amazed um, to find that Dewey was here a year ago, which was uh, uh, which is amazing. He's going to be talking about USB 4. And uh, then we're going to talk. Uh, and then the second, uh, the second item that we're going to talk about uh, is, uh, 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 how will I put this? Um, not well-known couple who frequently talk about Google Photos and and are often on our show. Uh, and they, uh, one year ago, talked about uh, smartphone photography and tips. And that, of course, would be the very popular Chris and Jim Gould who have that great Sunday show, What is That Button? So that will be, uh, that will be coming up on our second uh, item on our uh, on our premier service. And then the last, of course, is uh, Kiwi Poplick is going to talk about Wi-Fi passwords on Windows. So uh, that's going to be interesting. So those will be our three premier events today. And I'll be putting the link in the show um, through the day, a couple of times through through as we go through. Uh, so so um, you can uh, you can watch. And that'll be at half past, half past the hour after the show. So that's uh, that's our show today. So we have a big show for you. But before we get there, I want to thank um, we we need help paying the bills. And and again, today is our thank you to you. And you'll see that in some of the videos we have. We want to thank uh, the following people who were very generous with their donations this week. And that's uh, Barbara Taylor, Gerald Smith, and Elizabeth Bradley. So we want to thank those uh, individuals for donating. Thanks so much. We are almost at 100% of our uh, our goal this year, so uh, thank thanks again to everyone. Uh, um, this week in in the uh, newsletter on Saturday, uh, I put a link. I, I highlight one of my favorite channels, and the channel I highlighted was um, had to do with cars and EV cars and Toyotas, and so. Uh, guess what? <laughs> anyway, uh, it's called the, the so so it's interesting. It, it's a very interesting uh, channel to watch. He has over um, over uh, he has a lot of subscribers and over a million views for some of his videos. So they're very good. So you might want to have a look at that if you are interested in cars. So that was uh, that was in the link. Huey, we had a busy week last week, and we did learning Chromebooks, which was a big success, right? Yep, and I sent out a note to everybody who was signed up for the uh, learning Chromebooks, uh, giving them the links uh, for the video and for each of our videos. 
Uh, so if they weren't able to be on or if they want to go back and look at them, they can. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, also, I want to add a, a, a thank you. Uh, I guess some people do read the articles we put in the newsletter. I got I a really they... <laughs> nice I got a real nice note about the article that I posted about the uh, uh, the Writers Guild Association yeah. and how they feel about uh, AI. Right. And I got a really nice uh, note on uh on that article. So uh, uh, thanks. And uh, thanks for reading the newsletter. There are some great articles on Tuesdays and on Saturdays every week. Yes, they are. Yeah, for sure. And and everybody on the show contributes to the articles. You know, we have, they all have their, uh, and all have their different articles they do. So it, it's it's very interesting. And we, we do put a lot of effort into the newsletter. So if you haven't, haven't subscribed, just pop over to www.techforsenior.com. And you can, of course, um, just subscribe to the newsletter. And not only subscribe, please read them. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I went over to my friends the other day and was helping him. And he said, well, I have this other email account. And he says, that's where all your newsletters go. And he couldn't remember the password to that particular email account. So I don't think he's <laughs> ever read any of the, the newsletters, <laughs> but he gets them. Bob, how are you doing? You, you've been a busy guy lately. Uh... Not any more than lately. I not mean, any more than usual. <laughs> I've gotten into a habit. If I don't at least produce one, maybe two videos per day, something's not going right. Yeah. But the good news was your internet, your uh, your your cellular transmissions doubled in speed. Yes. We have a new uh, account representative and... I said to him when he called and he wanted to know what he could do, I said, unless you can do something about my internet speed, I don't need to talk to you. And he said, well, wait a minute, wait a minute. Yes, I can. <laughs> okay. So now instead of having uh, six, we're talking about up speed. Yeah. Now I'm now at almost twice that speed. So I don't know if it's going to do any better or any worse. Well, really, the best the best well, you ever did was on that cruise ship. I thought that was yeah, spectacular. Well. So you should get back on the cruise. <laughs> <laughs> All right. And um, Ray Baxter, is it still snowing? Oh, no. we've uh, Actually, we did get a little bit of snow two days ago in the morning. It disappeared pretty quickly. Hopefully, what's the old expression? March comes in like a lion and goes out like a lamb. I'm, I'm waiting for the lamb to arrive. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> very good. Very good. Uh, and Bill James. Hello. You are on. What are you on? You're 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 looking awful fine today. Is <laughs> tell me tell me what you would be what you would be broadcasting on. Well, I'm threading in uncharted waters. I'm using the Mac again today. Ah. I'm later, going to um, give a presentation on some tips that I've learned so hopefully people don't think I'm not going to the dark side quite yet but uh. <laughs> well so I guess this is uh, this show is all about thanking our audience but also you asked for it right exactly uh, you asked for it you asked us for some Mac stuff <laughs> and you asked us for an Amazon tour and we sent Bob off to Amazon to go on a tour and record it for you. And we got Bill James and Mac. So you asked for it and you you got it, right? So that's yeah. part of what we're doing it, today. And thanks to Greg, uh, I've got a Mac and I've been playing with it as well. Right. So we want to thank, yes, for sure, Greg. Thank you so much for that. Uh, all right. So let's, let's get on with the show then. Bob, do you want to take it away? Uh, I can try. <laughs> Hit the button. <laughs> Here is the Avast Security News Roundup for the week ending March 24th, 2023. Severe security flaw found in markup tool on Pixel phones. A serious vulnerability found in the markup tool on Pixel phones can let hackers unredact and uncrop edited 
screenshots. Suppose you shared a screenshot of your bank statement with someone and used Pixel's markup tool to hide sensitive information, such as your bank account number or balance. The vulnerability allowed anyone to unredact that confidential information, provided you sent them an original screenshot file. When Google fixed the issue with the March 2023 security update, screenshots you shared before updating your pixels with the latest software can still be exploited, and your hidden information can be partially recovered. Update as soon as possible. Read more at AndroidAuthority.com. Google rolls out March 2023 update to Pixel 6, Pixel 6 Pro, and Pixel 6a. Last Monday, Google rolled out Android 13 QPR2 with the March 2023 security patch to the Pixel 4a, 5a, and the 7 series. This March update is now rolling out to the Pixel 6, 6 Pro, and 6a. The March update arrived a week late on the 13th instead of the 6th for the majority of Pixel phones. Last Monday, the Pixel 6, 6 Pro, and 6a did not receive any bills, with the original Tensor chip being the common hardware factor. Recent discoveries of serious security flaws addressed in this update make it imperative that you update to the latest OS release as soon as possible. Read more at 9to5Google. You should receive fewer scam texts following new FCC rules. Carriers are now required to block all text messages that appear to be scams. This is the FCC's first attempt to squash scam texts through regulations. Frankly, it's long overdue. Unfortunately, the FCC's anti-robocall actions haven't been very effective, so we're a bit skeptical about the new rule. If a text comes from an invalid, unallocated, or unused number, it will be automatically blocked per the FCC new rule. Additionally, text messages sent from phone numbers that are self-identified as never sending text messages, such as government or business landlines, will be blocked. Read more at ReviewGeek.com. First Pixel, now the window snipping tool, has a major privacy flaw. This flaw pops up when people save a screenshot using the snipping tool to crop it and then save the resulting PNG file by overwriting the original PNG file. Example, using the same name as the original file. However, saving the crop file under a new name doesn't result in the full screenshot being accessible. Much like the original Acropolis flaw for Pixel phones, this Windows vulnerability means sensitive information, such as financial info, private images, chat messages, could still be accessible in an image if you thought you cropped it out. You can always hit the Windows key, Shift key, and S to create a crop screenshot from the get-go. A fix has not been released. Read more at AndroidAuthority.com. Windows users need to update Outlook immediately. Hackers are actively exploiting a critical escalation of privilege vulnerability in Outlook, according to Microsoft. If you use Outlook on Windows, you need to update the email client today. Large organizations must consult Microsoft's instruction to quickly mitigate this threat. The exploit allows a hacker to access the victim's net NTL MV2 hash. From there, the hacker can gain access to the victim's network for further attacks or observation. To update Outlook manually, simply press the File tab, select Microsoft Account on the pop-out menu, click Update Options, and choose Update Now. Read more at ReviewGeek.com. Breach Forum Administrator Baphomet shuts down infamous hacking forum. 
In a sudden turn of events, Baphomet, the current administrator of Breach Forums, said in an update on March 21st, 2023, that the hacking forum has been officially taken down, but emphasized that it's not the end. The shutdown is suspected to have been prompted by suspicions that law enforcement may have obtained access to the site's configurations, source code, and information about the forum's users. Actors will likely continue to have an appetite for breached databases, and it maintains to be seen if this can be through an alternative venue or requires a new forum entirely. Cybersecurity firm Flashpoint said, Read more at thehackernews.com. Lionsgate streaming platform with 37 million subscribers leaks user data. Entertainment industry giant Lionsgate leaks user IP addresses and information about what content they watch on its movie streaming platform, according to research from Cyber News. The Cyber News research team discovered an unprotected 20 gigabyte of server logs that contained nearly 30 million entries, with the oldest dated May 2022. The logs exposed subscribers' IP addresses and user data concerning device, operating system, and web browser. Logs also leaked the platform's usage data, typically used for analytics and performance tracking. URLs found in logs contained titles and IDs of what contents users watched on the platform, along with search queries entered by the user. Read more at cybernews.com. FTC wants to make it easier to cancel subscriptions. The Federal Trade Commission on Thursday proposed provisions that would remove barriers to canceling subscriptions and recurring payments. The new guidance would work to end the seemingly never-ending struggles to cancel unwanted subscription payment plans, the FTC said in a release. The proposed rule would require that companies make it as easy to cancel a subscription as it is to sign up for one. Lena Khan, chair of the FTC, said in a statement, The FTC will be accepting public comments soon when a 60-day comment window opens. Read more at cnet.com. This week's must-read on the Avast blog. Read Avast's top articles on a new Instagram scam that uses fake Shine gift cards as a lure. Read the article at the link listed. Did you know? Mark Twain was born in 1835, a year in which Halley's Comet was visible from Earth. In 1909, he said, I came in with Halley Comet, and I expect to go out with it. When he died on April 21st, 1910, the comet was again visible in the night sky. The word robot comes from the Czech robota. This translates into forced labor or work. During the first live iPhone presentation, Steve Jobs had to frequently switch phones behind the desk. Otherwise, it would run out of RAM and crash. The sound of Star Wars lightsaber was created by pairing together the sound of an idle film projector and the buzz from an old TV set. Just thought you might want to know. That wraps up another week of the Avast Security News Roundup. Stay safe, stay secure, and I'll see you again next week. Bye-bye. Thanks, Bob. Good stuff. The bad guys are on the run, I see. Yeah, and that last thing that I warned you about, the Shine hack. Well, I got an email presenting me with one of those gift cards. (laughs) <laughs> you'll find it on our Facebook page, the explanation. So right, take a right. look at it so you okay. don't fall for it. Right. Okay. Well, thanks so much. All right. Uh, Huey and I would like to thank everyone for your support over the past three years. And we have made a couple of short videos for you that will ex- tell you how we feel about it. 
and uh, and then it, it's very self-explanatory and i'm going to play them now i'll play both of them huey and i ha i have one and huey has one now but i'll play both of them good morning good afternoon wherever you are i'm ron brown with tech for senior you know this is march the 27th this is the last episode in season three of tech for senior next week we'll be moving on to our fourth season and today I wanted to thank you, the audience, for your participation, your support, your help, and all the encouragement you've given us over the last three years. And I wanted just to review exactly what you've done. We started with some very modest beginnings, and I'll, uh, I'll let Bob sort of have the final word on that. I'm just surprised that we had 100 back the next week after yeah, the way one. we started <laughs> week number one <laughs> and of course and thanks everybody one, for sticking with us yeah and week one really wasn't when the disaster happened so i think in this thanks it is very important that i show you what you've supported the small group of you the 70 or so um that come each week and not only support us financially but you're there to cheer us on and I wanted just to show you what you've done over the past three years. And let's look at the amazing stats. But before we do that, just to review that we have two shows a week. We have the Monday show. We also have an extremely popular Thursday show called Tech for Senior Live. We have two newsletters that go out on Tuesday and Saturday, along with all the other videos that we create for seniors to view all over the world. Now, you may be impressed the fact that our YouTube channel has just under 6,000 uh, subscribers. And this is a, really a phenomenal success for, for a channel that's been around for about three years. This is extremely good growth. You might also be amazed that we have just under 900 videos on our channel. But our biggest accomplishment is the fact that those videos have been seen by over half a million people. That actually is, actually the number is just 608,000 people around the world have watched our videos and they've been translated into many different languages. Let's look at the different countries that people have watched our videos in. United States, Canada, United Kingdom, India, Brazil, Japan, Mexico, Germany, France, China. Really enjoy, and, and you can see them, they're, they're going like this. Yeah, and, yeah. And clapping their hands, and, uh, and they really enjoy each, not only the music, but the intro that Ray gives right. and the background to the yeah. artists and to the music. It really, uh, it adds a lot to our show and it fits into what our original concept was to keep it happy to keep That's right it, and, and yep. to keep from having to talk about what's going on in the rest of the world yeah. and with sickness and everything else we right, want to right. keep it keep <clears throat> everything away from that topic <clears throat> and we want to make people happy and enjoy their time with tech for seniors and uh, and i think his the music makes a big part of that not only have our videos been viewed in many different countries, but they have also been auto-translated into many different languages, such as Spanish, French, Italian, Indonesian, Portuguese, Japanese, Vietnamese, Thai, Korean, Hindi, Dutch, and Polish. So on behalf of everyone at Tech for Senior, we want to thank you, the audience that comes here each week to support us to keep this project going. Huey now is going to thank the staff that work so hard at producing all these videos. Thank you so much from Huey and Ron of Tech for Seniors. It's been a great three years. We're going to start our fourth. We want to thank you, the audience, our friends, our regulars, those that are new. We love you all. We're glad you're here. Without you, there would be no show. Thank you again so much. I want to thank Bob G. He's been with us since episode one. He started out just as a visitor to help us out. 
he became our gatekeeper and started his weekly security news and has been doing it ever since. Thanks again, Bob. And Dewey Kloos was with us on our first show, became a regular for a while, then he retired. But we want to thank Dewey for all his time and effort and his great presentations. Ray Baxter joined us later on as our music, to do a music section. He did such a great job. Everybody loved it. That became a regular feature of Tech for Seniors. Again, thanks, Ray, for that. Also, Bill James has joined us with some presentations and has become a regular on the Tech for Senior Live. Mike Ungerman has become a regular. He's done a series of presentations on solar panels, and now he's been doing one on electronic vehicles. And thanks to Mike for joining us and making our show uh, such a success. This is Ron at episode one and me on episode one. We've come a long way since then. If you go back and watch the first few episodes, it was interesting and we were fumbling and we were trying to make it work, but it did. Uh, on that first time, uh, we had some people doodling on the screen. We didn't know how to shut that off. We soon learned after the first episode, people couldn't write on the screen. We also got Zoom bombed. I think it was our second or third episode and Bob helped us with that and we haven't been Zoom bombed since. Our first logo and intro was in black and white with a little coloring for the, some of the letters and then we were able to colorize it. We had a lot of special guests over the past three years. Uh, Chris and Jim Gould from Geeks on Tour have visited us a few times and, and done presentations, but they're also in the audience quite often. Michael Daniels, one of our good friends from his community, tech, uh, Tinkering with Tech, has done presentations for us. He also joins us in the audience at times. George Bowden do a presentation on Raspberry Pi. We've had some other speakers. I don't have pictures of them and I apologize. I do know Marsha Berkey did a presentation and I think there's one or two others that did and I'm sorry I'm not including you, uh, but we do recognize the fact that you have been a big help, all of you who've done presentations for us. You, the audience, are our important part. Without you, there would be no show. And again, another thank you from both Ron and myself. Thank you so much, everyone, from both me and from Ron at Tech for Seniors. Let's have a great fourth season. All right. Well, thanks so much. Thank you, everyone, for for supporting us, and uh, we look forward to a great season four. And we ha hope to have more Mac stuff. Speaking of Mac, Bill James, where are you? Oh, I better make you a co-host. Um, where are I am. Here? I'm a co-host. Oh, are you? Okay, great. Okay, I'm good. Take it away. All right. You know the right commands on the Mac, do you? Yeah. <laughs> oh, no, yeah. I've learned that already. <laughs> So what we're going to talk about is Mac OS tips, and I kind of subtitled this learning the Mac for Windows users. Mac versus PC. Before we get into the details, however, any comparison of Macs and PC needs to note that Macs are PCs. 
In fact, as Apple used to say in the boilerplate of every press release, Apple ignited the personal computer revolution in the 1970s with the Apple II and reinvented the personal computer in the 1980s with the Macintosh. Nor is it, strictly speaking, a comparison between the Mac operating system and Windows because a Mac actually can run Windows. The operating system on a PC or Mac is a fundamental part of the user experience. Windows 8 was something of a car crash in terms of design and customer satisfaction. Thankfully, Windows 10 has turned out to be a good OS, but there's still a long way to go. You ask why we're doing this. It is curiosity to find out what Windows has that Mac OS doesn't, or what features Mac OS has that Windows doesn't. The fact is that over the years, the two operating systems have become more and more similar in terms of features. If you are a Windows user moving to the Mac, mm -hmm. then we think you won't miss anything. And the same goes for the move from the Mac OS to Windows. But learning a new operating system is the frustrating factor in any switch. The benefits have to outweigh the disadvantages of the unfamiliar. For anyone who already uses an iPhone or iPad, we feel that Mac OS will be familiar even if you use Windows, which may be a good reason to move over to Mac. So some of our tips, make the most out of Spotlight Search. Using Spotlight on the Mac or the search feature any other Mac device is a massive time saver. Spotlights will let you search for any file, photo, or app you have, and it can even help you do some basic math and convert currencies. And with the right Spotlight search tips, you can search for anything instantly. Use the Control Center. To open your Mac's Control Center, you need to click on the Control Center icon in the right top right corner of your screen. You can then use any of the controls available. What's great is that you can customize a control center on a Mac to get the most useful controls at your disposal. To exit the control center, click anywhere on your Mac screen or click the control center icon once again. Where to find apps that aren't in the dock? If there is a symbol on your Mac keyboard, you can press the F4 key to open Launchpad. As we previously showed you, you can use Spotlight and type Launchpad. The Launchpad icon should also be located on your Mac's dock. This is an icon with nine squares of different colors. Once you open Launchpad, you will be able to see all the apps on your Mac. Incidentally, the dock is the same as a taskbar in Windows. Use apps in full screen mode. When you use an app in full screen mode, it covers your whole Mac screen, which is perfect for avoiding distractions. You won't be able to see your menu bar at the top of the dock at the bottom, but you can still access them by moving your pointer to your menu bar or the dock's location. Learn to quit apps on a Mac. It might not seem obvious at first, but quitting apps on your Mac is pretty straightforward. And there are a couple ways to go about it. First, you can click the close button, the red button with the X located in the top left corner of the apps window. However, this only closes the window and might leave some apps running in the background like the mail app. To completely quit an app on your Mac, Click the app's name in the menu bar and you can choose quit application. If you are about, if you're all about learning keyboard shortcuts on your Mac, you can just press command plus Q instead. Sources for this was Macworld, Mac versus PC, top tips and tricks for Mac beginners. Back to you, Ron. There we go. So it's not that different. Nope. 
I Not thought black people were so smart because they. <laughs> <laughs> so it's all the same. All right, there you go. Well, well, we look forward to more information about more to that. come. Yeah, more to come. Hopefully, yeah. I can enlist Huey to help. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> there you go. There you go. All the good stuff. I think now, Chris and uh, Chris and uh, had something to say about this too. So maybe she can help. So we'll. Oh, get... Jim uses Jim uses. Oh, Jim. Mac. Jim. I'm yeah, sorry. Jim uses Mac all the time, and he converted. He's the big convert converter. So he's he's all in with Mac now. So yeah. <laughs> so anyway, uh, yes, and so now. Because you asked for it, right, we sent Bob off to an Amazon fulfillment center, and he actually um, videoed it for us, and he's going to show us part one of his trip to, um, to, to the Amazon warehouse. Right, Bob? Yeah, here we go. We're about to join an Amazon virtual tour of their fulfillment centers and in this live presentation because you'll see that I asked a question and it was actually answered by one of the people participating in it so although I thought first this was a recording it couldn't have been because they answered my question right within the show and the places that we visited were New Jersey Germany and Italy so enjoyed a little tour. I did. I hope you take advantage of it and schedule your own virtual tour of an Amazon fulfillment center. They should move. Now that's pretty amazing. Now again, there is no tech in the shelving units, only in the robots and that software that propels it around. So a lot of people will ask me, um, Kate, how do you store your products? Well, we store them right here on the shelves. We store items from granola bars to sporting goods equipment, basically any product that is the size of a microwave oven or smaller will fit into these shelving units and be stored on those shelves. It's pretty awesome. We carry tens of millions of items inside of our fulfillment centers. Okay, so what happens if an item falls off one of these shelves? What do we do? Well, we have a team of folks that is responsible for retrieving those products off the floor. They are called our amnesty responders. They wear a special tech vest that contains gadgets and sensors and artificial intelligence to keep them safe. They also carry around a tablet device with them that maintains a steady stream of communication between themselves and the robotic floor. So they can actually walk out there and retrieve a product safely. They might replace those stickers as well or clean up spills that happen on the floor. Great news is that nobody needs any prior education or training to work with our robotic drive units. We train right here in-house at Amazon. In fact, we've recently announced a $1.2 billion initiative to fully fund college education for our frontline workers, which is incredible. Okay, so now that you've learned about the robots, it's time to learn how they help us in the process of getting you your items. And to show you how we start that process, I'm gonna send you back across the ocean to Germany with Patricia. Thank you so much, Kate, and welcome back, everyone. Another quick journey, hope you enjoyed it. So this is what is happening on the robotics floor, and like Kate already mentioned, I am now going to introduce you to our first tour stop, which is called Pick. So this is happening in the background, and we may take a look at what our colleague Luisa is doing in the background. We're appreciating having a closer look to the process. First of all, thanks again for everyone joining. We've seen a couple of messages, so it's great to see you being online. And as an example, let's say one of our guests may order a little item, say a deck of cards. We focus on the smaller items here at the Robotic Fulfillment Centers. Therefore, a deck of cards is definitely something applicable that could have been ordered by one of our guests or our customers. In this case, someone ordered a deck of cards in Germany and Fra7 might be the chosen fulfillment center taking care of that specific order. So what is happening? Luisa is getting the information on the screen. So she's getting the order on her display and she's getting all of the information needed. So she has the information on the screen saying the deck of cards, the picture of the item, a description, and in the background you see 
the yellow pot, there is the inventory inside and she is getting information of where the deck of cards actually is. So she once has the information on the screen, but she also have a visual support. So take a closer look. There is a bright light beam, which is illuminating the correct bin. Recall that pick by light, crazy technology that we have. This is super exciting to see right now as it's happening. So she's getting all of the information needed, knowing where the item is placed in which bin. She's then picking the item, scanning the barcode, and putting the item into the correct tote. Which tote is the correct one, you might ask? Take a closer look at the gray bar over there. And you see we have a couple of buttons and actually the one that is lighting up in green color is the correct tote, the correct black box. So we do use the technology and make advantage of that and knowing where to put the items in. We have a couple of black totes here at that specific station. At some point, these totes need to be pushed through onto the conveyance because the totes are full. We have that all registered in our system and we know when this moment is happening. So you might see it later on. At some point, those black totes will be pushed onto the conveyance, onto the ramp, if you want to say it like that. And next up will be the tote elevator lifting up the toad and putting it on the main conveyance belt that we have in place at all of our fulfillment centers. Taking a closer look at the workstation itself, you will see that everything is set up in a designated order and we want to make sure that the workstation is actually ergonomically friendly. This is important to us, the health of our employees of course always our top priority and therefore we make sure to listen to their feedback and implement all of the improvements that should be in place. So the designated workstation in the background is set up the same way at every fulfillment center that we have. Whenever we get further feedback from our employees, we make sure to actually take a closer look of where we can have improvements being implemented rather sooner than later, of course. This is the pick process. A lot of picking happening in the background. The toes are full at some point, and like I said, pushed through onto the conveyance. The conveyance is pretty exciting to see because it kind of looks like a roller coaster ride. We are actually taking you on that roller coaster ride thanks to virtual tours. Next tour stop gonna be the pack department. That's gonna be in Italy. So you're going to meet another dear colleague of mine shortly, Federica, calling in from Turin. But first of all, enjoy the roller coaster ride and see you later. Before we go on that roller coaster ride, you may have noticed that I've posed a question. I wanted to know why do some items get delivered quickly and others take much longer? And you'll find out later that that question actually gets answered. Now let's go for that roller coaster ride. Wow, what a fun roller coaster ride. Hello, everyone. Well, I must say ciao a tutti. I'm Federica, but you can call me Fede. I'm streaming from TRN1, which is our fulfillment center located in the northwest of Italy, close to the beautiful city of Turin. I'm here today with my dear colleague, Carmen. Ciao, Carmen. Thank you so much for your support. She's actually packing our brother that we just picked, that Patricia just showed us how to pick them, how we pick them. And she's now packing all of our customers' orders. But before going to give a closer look of what our colleague Carmen is doing, I would like you to notice that she's actually wearing gloves, which are part of our PPE. Don't worry, we do use many acronyms in Amazon, uh, but it's an acronym that is standing for Personal Protective Equipment. Gloves are just one of the many um, safety uh, equipment that we use inside our, our fulfillment center. And they're actually for free because we do have some vending machines. Yes, you heard it correct. We have 
vending machines full of different PPE, um, personal protective equipment. You can see the picture now, now on the on the screen. And inside them, you can find earplugs, clothes, high visibility vests, box openers, whatever anyone might need inside our fulfillment center to work in a safe environment. Because for us, for Amazon, safety first, remember that. Well, let's give a closer look to the process now. Carmen is starting the process, receiving the thoughts of the conveyor. Begin, and she begins the process by scanning each item. The computer then, the, on the little monitor, on the little screen that the colleague has in front of her, will suggest Carmen which box size to use. The system is in fact intelligent enough to calculate to know exactly the correct box size for your orders. As items, in fact, as items comes for the first time inside our inventory, we record its size and weight. And then this information is stored in a big database, which is referenced here to determine, like to calculate the optimal box size for your order. I think this is pretty, pretty cool. That is part one of three. <laughs> so that was very interesting. So Bob, when I when we did our tour of uh, the fulfillment center, um, there, it was interesting because once those boxes are completed, they went down this fast conveyor belt, like really fast. And it's coming up. And they were all weighed. And it was all based on weight. And if the weight didn't match the individual items, it was kicked off because there might be the wrong item in the box, right? Yep. Yep. Okay. That's coming up in the next episode. Part two. I can hardly, I can hardly wait. That's great. So well done. Thank you so much. Uh, if you have been to a fulfillment center, why don't you put it in the chat? Let us know. I'm just wondering how many people actually have visited one. It's, as I said, in our computer club. Uh, I don't remember if Greg went with us. We we went, uh, it was quite a while ago. It took me two years to or organize that we went to a fulfillment center in the Mesa area, and it was quite quite interesting. All right, uh, Ray, after all the nice things we yes. said about you today, are you ready to roll? I was going to go home, but no, I'm, oh, I, wait a minute, I am home. No, I am, <laughs> I'm ready to roll. All right, there you go. Amin Karamalu, Phantom of the Opera. So last week, uh, we had friends visit us from California. And as is typical in the Baxter household, it didn't take long for the discussion to turn to music-related topics. What a surprise. Now, the singer Ramin Karamalu came up, a name I'd never heard before. And after some research, decided his story would be worthwhile mentioning this morning. Now, according to, I say chat GPT, but it was actually Bing chat, Ramin Kamaru is an Iranian Canadian singer and actor, best known for his work in musicals. He was born September 19th, 1978 in Tehran, Iran. When he was two months old, his parents were forced to flee Iran because of the Islamic revolution. Now, after spending two years in Italy, the family moved to Petersburg, Canada, where Kamaru grew up. His website outlines Karamalu's early musical career after subsequently relocating to the UK. In 2000, he played the title role of Aladdin in a small production that was his start in a variety of musical stage shows. By 2007, he had taken on the lead role in the Phantom of the Opera musical, which he continued for two more years. Then in 2014, he made his Broadway debut and was nominated for a Tony for Best Actor in a Musical for his role in Les Miserables. Since then, he has appeared in stage performances around the globe, as well as individual episodes of television series in England and America, yet still found time to release his second solo album titled From Now On, which reached number 11 on the Billboard Heat Seekers chart. Now, when I lived in Southern California, I saw Phantom of the Opera at least three times, 
at the Amundsen Theater in downtown Los Angeles. And this continues to be one of my all-time favorite musical stage shows. So today's clip is Remen singing the music of the night from this Andrew Lloyd Webber musical. What a beautiful voice. Well yes. done, Ray. Well, what a fitting song to finish season three with. A, a big, a big, a big, uh, a big production like that. Thanks so much. Uh, you know, <laughs> thanks to Jim Gould. I was I was sitting here just enjoying the show, enjoying the moment, not paying a, attention to my notes. And and you know, I, I got you the story, and I forgot to stop the YouTube feed. So Jim Jim was right on the mark, and it said. Uh, sent me a message in the chat so for those of you if you are did you if you did come over sorry to abruptly pull the plug on the <laughs> youtube feed but i didn't get a chance to do my little little uh little talk i do before we stop the feed so i just pulled the plug but anyway there you go uh well thanks everyone for coming today another this is the last of season three huey of course will be your host next week i get the week off so he will be your host for the first uh, the first show in season four. You nervous, Huey? <laughs> of course. <laughs> well, as a, anyway, um, we will of course um, be starting our Q and A now, uh, and we'll uh, if you have any questions you want to talk about the show, but just remember uh, if you uh, want to. Uh, see the Q and A, or sorry, the uh, oh, I. That's the other thing I better do. I, I'll put the link in the chat now for the um, for the um, premiere uh, video, and we'll uh, we'll have that in about uh, about twenty minutes, and then of course um, we will uh, see everybody. If you want to watch the show on Thursday, we'll all be the gang. Will be there, and we'll do this all again on Thursday. Carl, go ahead. Yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you, Ray. I, that brought back a lot of fine memories. I saw it in Phantom of Opera twice in Toronto. I saw Les Mis Rare, and I saw Miss Saigon, all awesome productions. I saw it also in Detroit and in uh, Texas when I was visiting there. But, you know, I, I, maybe other, I don't know if other people do this, but I'm always comparing it to the first show I ever had. You know, the first one that blows you away. It's just after that, it's it's not the same effect. And I'm always comparing it to uh, Michael Crawford and, and Sarah Brightman. And when I hear it now, I'm always comparing to that first show. It, it's still awesome, though. Good. Yes, it was. I remember when we took the kids over to Vancouver and we saw it in live in uh, in Vancouver, and it was uh, it was truly um, spectacular, particularly. Um, the, the the chandelier coming down at the very opening it was really really spectacular it really was quite quite uh, quite amazing the one the scene that I remember when they were in the canals and he, you know uh, yeah the phantom was crying yeah that was indeed amazing. So I put the link for the premiere video in the uh, just in the chat. So if anyone uh, needs to know it, but it's also in our Saturday newsletter. Yes, it was. Uh, it was. It's certainly amazing. Andrew Lloyd Webber is just amazing with all the. He keeps coming up with the the you know this amazing number of tunes that uh, they're so so um, identifying and and you just can listen to them over and over and over again. Well, there's something about the Pantages Theater in Toronto. There's nothing like it. Mm -hmm. For sure. It was so long ago. Uh, the first play I saw, uh, a, a big production, was the uh, a Jesus Christ Superstar, and I went to mm -hmm. I drove to Toronto to see it. Mm -hmm. Was that at, was that at the Pantages Theater? Do you know? I I have no recollection. <laughs> Yeah, the other was. big one, Carl, was Les Miserables. That was uh, the other big production. That, you know, the two big ones that I've seen would be those two. And and Miss Saigon, when that helicopter made the sounds when it opened up, <laughs> yeah. it was something else. Yeah. Chris and Jim, hello. Hey. Well, I just want if some if anybody wanted to see how to get text from a photo, that question came up earlier. Can you show us? 
I could I could demonstrate if you want. You yeah. need to be. Do you need to be co-host? I guess you need to be co-host, eh? Well, no, okay. Not if oh, I'll make no. I'll make you co-host if you want. Your co-host if you want to share your screen. So I don't know who was it? What? Uh, Carl. I, I think they said a Samsung. You had a Samsung. Yes. Right. Okay. Right. And do you use Google Photos? Yes. Okay. Well, you can do it with either Google Photos or Gallery. I'll 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 show both. So this is this is my Samsung. No, it's too bright. <laughs> and I will go first to Google Photos. Too dark. <laughs> and find a picture that has text in it. In Google Photos, you use um, you use oops the button called Lens. <laughs> and I have examples for Lens. So if I have a picture of a business card and I want to copy that text from it, you use the lens button, which is this third one over here. Just tap lens. And then you have your choice. If it's in a different language, you can translate it. If you just want to copy the text there, if you want to search or shop or, you know, all sorts of things, but text is what you're talking about. And I would just select all and copy. Now I can go anywhere, for example, a keep message. Uh, Google Keep is my note app, and you can paste. So it's, it's copied all the text from that card. You can do the same thing with gallery. It's just a different button. So in gallery, and I will open a something with so here is a picture I took of a sign with a bunch of text on it and in Samsung it's this button up at the top called Samsung Vision you tap that it does basically the same thing that uh, that lens does you tap text then then you have to tap and you know Grab the little handles to select the text you want. And then copy. And once again, that's I can now go someplace else and paste it. All right. Very good. Thank you. And can same you can be done on can, Apple too. So can you can you also paste it into like a word? Uh, sure. Uh, if you have a if you have the word. Uh, yeah. app on your phone yeah, or you can I, paste it into an email and email it to yourself or whatever <laughs> well most likely I may want to edit it you know so mm -hmm. thank you good job yep welcome thank you so much um, Kathleen yes I have actually been trying to find it this is one of those things where you look everywhere and they don't cover this particular aspect in sharing a screen if I participant wanted to share my screen I click share screen but then where do how, where do I go from there to find what I'm sharing I mean do I where do you, I what do I do you, next Kathleen you wouldn't be able to unless one of the hosts gave you permission to share your screen. That's okay. how we prevent people from Zoom bombing us, okay? If anybody was allowed to share the screen, then we would have what we have happen in episode number two, which is something we never ever want to have happen again. Now, if the host allowed me to share my screen, how would I, what, how do I, how do I put what I want to share on the screen? The very top uh, left button would share your entire screen. If you had something else opened, you could select it and just share that particular item that you had open. When, when I share something, I open it prior to actually wanting to share it. 
That way I could select that particular item to share it. But if you had lots of things to share, then you would share your entire screen. And then you just, whatever you show on your screen would also be shared with the rest of the people that you're sharing your screen with. How do yeah, I get it on my screen? That's the part that I haven't figured out. I mean, that's probably okay. a really basic question, but it's pretty easy, Kathleen. If you do it when you share your screen, when you when you hit the share button, the menu that opens up gives you. It's real simple. It says, "Do you want to share your whole screen? Do you want to share part of your screen?" It tells you, "Do you want to share?" It's real easy. You just click the button, and it'll it'll do it. Right? It's so okay. simple to do. You, it'll, Kathleen. It'll give you the easiest way to do this is after you finish here, open up Zoom and open up sharing a screen. You become okay. your own your own person within oh. the show. So you open up a Zoom meeting. The only one in it will be you. Okay. And then you can share your screen. Thank you, you. And you'll see what all of the different things are that you can you can utilize. One of the other programs they want you to share your screen and your photographs, and I tried to even figure out how to do it. But thank you, you. It's real simple. Verified this, okay? Yeah. Thank it's you real so simple, much. Kathy. Yeah, yeah. Steve, go ahead. Um, in Windows, with the System Volume Information folder. Does it does Windows use that folder for anything other than restore points? Bill, can you answer that? I don't know. I don't either. I didn't understand the question. Say it again. Well, there's a there's a folder in Windows that it puts on every drive as soon as you start to look at it or do anything with it called system volume information. It's normally a hidden one, but if you tell it to view hidden folders and stuff, you'll see it. Um, and it'll say it's zero size, even though it isn't. It's what it stores is the restore point information. So that right. if you've got system restore turned on, that's where all the files are collected. I wanted to know if it stores anything else in that system volume information folder apart from the restore points. I don't have an answer, Steve. I'd have to check it. Um, I would think it's just the restore points. I couldn't see yeah. it with restoring anything. Storing well, anything the, the annoying thing is, though, that if you've got a lot of other USB drives, it puts the system volume information folder on those as well, even though you don't have system restore turned on for those USB drives. It still puts that folder in there anyway. What I was hoping to do is to find a way of not putting of preventing windows from putting that folder there in the first place i don't think you have that choice this this might be a good question for for chat gpt yep you think so? would, okay. yeah um i'll put the link in the 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 chat steve there's a how to geek on that topic what is system volume information folder and can i delete it and I'll put you, put it in the chat for you. Okay. And um, so there is. So other people have thought about that, and I, I don't. I haven't read the article, but that's the article. It's uh, should be in the chat now, and that's uh, that should answer your question. Hey, how about ask an AI? You do that. Too. Well, 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 that's well, Chat GPT is AI. Yeah. Well, those. Well, everyone's doing that. Uh, Carl, can you um, go ahead? Yeah, thank you. Hey, I want to uh, thank uh, uh, Bob for that information on the uh, uh, was the FTC was doing is going to open up uh, for comments on uh, was that the group that you mentioned? Or that, the that's correct. That's correct. They're going to when, open it how, up for comment once they're ready to do that. It's not quite ready yet, but that how, will be how, the next thing. Well, I want to uh, put something in there, and in one particular, I get. Direct TV, and every once in a while, somebody will call me up and say, "Hey, you got 30 days to try this, uh, whatever." And but if you don't remember to call them before 30 days, you end up paying for that free thing for the rest of your life. 
<laughs> what I would, that's my complaint, that that should not be permitted. In other words, if they give you something for 30 days, they don't even tell you when you're doing it if, that you need to end it before the 30 days. That's the, that's the downside. That's one downside. But the other downside is, they're, they're, first of all, they should have some, there's no, I'm paying for something for months and I don't know unless I look at my bill, but guess what? Today, you don't even have paper bills anymore. Oh, you still do. You still do. Well, you I have can't. a credit. I have a credit card that I can't understand their online explanation because what they show never adds up to what's actually been charged unless I get the paper bill. So I canceled my automatic payments just so I would get the paper bill. They do have to send you a paper bill. Well, DirecTV says they will send you a paper bill, but I didn't know you could uh, pay it uh, without a credit card. Yeah, send them a check. Every month? But, every month? Well, if that's what you want decide to do, you could. It's not, it's not something I would do. And well, also, if you get a 30-day trial, look very carefully because they'll have a place where it says that at the end of the 30 days, you automatically pay. Or in many instances, you have the option for them to notify you when it's time to make that payment. Well, that, well that, that's my beef. This is all done on the phone. There's no there's no documentation that I agreed to it. It's sent to you in your email. Usually that's. No, I didn't get anything. All I got when I opened up my bill some months later, I'm being billed for this premium package. And when I called on it, they said, well, you agreed to it. I said, I agreed to it 30 days. They said, well, you know, you didn't tell us you didn't want it after that. That's the way it normally goes. Mm -hmm. Be sure and watch because you, like you say, Carl, you don't want to be paying for this forever and not knowing it. Well, that, well, that's my complaint to the FTC if I get a chance to do it. Mm -hmm. All right, everyone, beware. That's, that's a good point, Carl. Thanks for bringing that up. Uh, okay, any more questions? All right. Well. We want to thank you and say goodbye to year three, right? Year four will be uh, will be next week. And Huey will be um, on the reins next week. Uh, I'll be, we'll all be there this Thursday. We'll be, uh, come and listen to our show on Thursday. Uh, and we'll have a great show, show for you next Monday. All right. Bye, bye everyone. Bye, everybody. Bye-bye yeah, now.